Welcome to the lecture for Basics of Biblical Hebrew, Chapter 19. In this chapter, we will be studying how to attach pronominal suffixes to verbs in Hebrew. The verbs we'll be using in this chapter are the perfect, the imperfect, and the imperative. There are a couple of things we need to review before we go into the verbs. First, you'll recall in the noun chapters that there were two types of pronominal suffixes, type 1 and type 2. With verbs, we'll be using type 1 pronominal suffixes. Secondly, you also will recognize from our study of the nouns that there were two different translation values, possessive and objective. Let's review those together. Let me show you. We'll begin by taking the noun sus, meaning horse, and adding the 3ms pronominal suffix o. We're going to translate this particular construction as his horse. The translation his is the possessive translation value of the pronominal suffix third masculine singular o. If we take that exact same pronominal suffix and add it to a preposition, lo, this is translated, this construction is translated as to him. The translation him is the objective value of the 3ms pronominal suffix. So it's the same suffix, holum while, or o, but it's translated either possessively, his, or objectively, him. Now when it comes to verbs, we're going to be using the objective translation value. Look at your screen with me. When a pronoun is the direct object of a verb, it is commonly attached to the definite direct object marker, yishmor othanu. There is, however, another way of indicating this grammatical construction. The object pronoun may also be added directly to the verb as a pronominal suffix. So let's look at the two examples on this particular slide. The first example, yishmor othanu, he will keep us. You see the 1cp pronominal suffix attached to the definite direct object marker, he will keep us. In the second example, yishmorenu, you see the 1cp pronominal suffix attached directly to the verb, he will keep us. Notice that both constructions have the exact same translation value. The difference is simply where the pronominal suffix appears. Sometimes it will appear on the, the definite direct object marker, other times it will appear directly on the verb. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about those pronominal suffixes that appear directly on the verb. We'll begin by reviewing the type 1 pronominal suffixes that will appear on verbs in Hebrew. Look at your screen with me. In general, verbs will use type 1 pronominal suffixes with the objective translation values. So on your screen, you will see that all of the different type 1 suffixes that you studied in the noun chapters. In addition, you need to review your alternate type 1 suffixes. In the third column on this chart, you will see all of the different objective translation values that you would have used, for example, when you saw these forms appearing on prepositions. There are no new forms to learn on this chart. It's simply a matter of reviewing what you will see on verbs you already know. So again, this is one of those great things about Hebrew. You're taking something you already know, these pronominal suffixes, and now we're going to be taking a look at how they appear on verbs. So there's going to be some new stuff, but reviewing and reinforcing some of the stuff that we already know. Let's begin by talking about how pronominal suffixes will appear on the perfect conjugation verbs, okay? The perfect conjugation verbs. Look at your chart with me. In this chart, you're going to see the spelling of the cal perfect with pronominal suffixes. In the left column, you will see the regular spelling of the cal perfect without suffixes, your paradigm forms in the left column. In the right column, you will see the cal perfect as it is spelled before it takes a pronominal suffix. Notice in this particular chart, the 2MP and the 2FP categories are blank. That's because pronominal suffixes don't appear on those particular verbs, and so there's no need to see any of the changes that occur. In the right-hand column, you will see highlighted in red all of the different spelling changes that occur when a pronominal suffix appears on a verb. Now in most instances, the spelling changes are just related to the vowels. So if you look in the 3ms form, for example, you'll see that the comets pathic vowel pattern has shift to shawa comets before pronominal suffix. That same spelling change also occurs in the 3cp. And similarly, way down at the 1cp, the last form, you'll simply see that the comets has changed to schwa. 
Those aren't major changes. The three forms that we want to take a moment to concentrate on are the 3FS, the 2MS, and the 2FS forms. You'll see that with these three forms, the spelling changes go beyond simple vocalization of the vowels. There's a little bit of a, a change in terms of a loss or addition of the consonant itself. Let's begin with the 3FS form. Look at the 3FS form, katala. You will see that in the form before pronominal suffix, the comets he so formative of the perfect conjugation has changed to pathic tau. Now you know why this occurs. You already know that any time a particular word ends in a he, you can't add anything to it without the he changing. Now the he can do one of two things. It can entirely drop off or that he can strengthen to a tau. You've seen that happen in the construct state. You've also seen that happen when you add a pronominal suffix to um, feminine singular nouns that end in comets hey. Likewise, in the 3FS category, the, the comets hey is going to change to pathic tau. And so that's a significant change. Additionally, you'll see that in the 2MS category, you will see that the final comets under the tau subformative has dropped off. And you'll get some kind of connecting vowel that will appear with the verb, connecting it to the pronominal suffix. And that connecting vowel will be variable, sometimes E class, sometimes A class. And finally, you'll see that the 2FS form ends in tau hiric yod. It looks like the 1CS form at the end. So these are the three forms that you'll need to pay special attention to, the 3FS, the 2MS, and the 2FS. In fact, you'll need to memorize the spelling of these three particular forms so that when you encounter them in context, you won't be, t you won't be caught off guard. But here's a little good news. Let me share with you some statistical comfort. That is, sometimes when you learn these things, you wonder how often do they actually occur? How significant it is for me to memorize these things? And when I do tell you to memorize things, you need to memorize them because oftentimes what you're learning here will apply down the road. However, in this particular case, when you come to a particularly difficult form like the 2FS form, where you have now that T ending that looks like the 1CS form, just note this, with the Cal perfect, a pronominal suffix occurs with the 2FS form only seven times in the Hebrew Bible. So you're not going to see it that often. And so even though I'm asking you to memorize it for a whole host of reasons that you'll understand later, you're actually not going to be too overwhelmed by this change in your reading of the text. In fact, these particular three forms that exhibit the greatest changes, the 2MS, the 2FS, and the 1CS, don't appear that often with pronominal suffixes. And so in context, you won't be caught off guard too often. All right, but they're still important forms to memorize. They're still important forms to memorize. The big forms that appear with pronominal suffixes are the 3MS, the 3CP, and the 1CS. And those forms are pretty easy to identify in context. Those forms occur um, over 300 times, over 200 times, and almost 200 times. So you'll see those forms all the time, the 3MS, the 3CP, and the 1CS. So in terms of frequency, those are the forms you want to get down. But in terms of irregularity, it's the infrequent one, which kind of violates our principle, that which is most common is most irregular. Here in this case, that which is least common is actually the most irregular. But every rule likes to violate itself somehow. Look at your screens again with me, and now you'll see in the next slide the Cal Perfect 3MS appearing with each of the different pronominal suffixes. So you'll see in the first example, Catalni, the Cal Perfect 3MS with the 1CS pronominal suffix, and it's translated, he killed me. Notice what is just one word in Hebrew, katalani, is actually three words in English when it's translated, he killed me. The subject of the verb is embedded in the verb itself, then you translate the verb, and then you translate the object of the verb, which has been suffixed directly to the verb. So one cluster of consonants represents three different English words. Okay, now we can see that in the 2MS as well. Katalacha, he killed you. Katalech, he killed you, feminine. Katalo, he killed him or it. So you can see in each case, the pronominal suffix is attached directly to the perfect verb, and it causes slight spelling changes in each instance. All right, now once you become familiar with the spelling changes and the fact that you already know the pronominal suffixes, identification of these forms in context shouldn't provide too much difficulty. 
At first, it will be a little bit uncomfortable, but the more you progress in the language, the easier this will become. Now that we've looked at the cal perfect with pronominal suffixes, let's move to the cal imperfect with pronominal suffixes. Look at your screens with me. Once again, in the left-hand column, you will see the cal perfect without suffixes. That is the paradigm that you've memorized back in chapter 15. In the right-hand column, you will see the cal imperfect as it appears before pronominal suffixes. Once again, you'll see two blank spaces, the 3fp and the 2fp. Those forms don't appear with a pronominal suffix in the Hebrew Bible, and so we haven't included them. Of the remaining eight forms that do occur, you'll see that there are not that many changes highlighted in red in that right column. In fact, the only change that you will observe is the fact that in those forms that maintain the O-class stem vowel, that O-class stem vowel has reduced to vocal schwa in every instance in those forms that take a pronominal suffix. Now let me say that again. The only change in the spelling of the imperfect conjugation when it takes a pronominal suffix is that in those forms that preserved the O-class stem vowel, that O-class stem vowel or the A-class stem vowel with other types reduces to vocal schwa. That's the only change. So the preformative and consonants and vowels are the same. The subformative consonants and vowels are the same. The only thing that changes is the reduction of that stem vowel, and then you'll see the addition of the pronominal suffix. So the imperfect verbs are really easy to identify with pronominal suffixes, and imperfect verbs in general occur more frequently with pronominal suffixes than perfect verbs. So this is a very nice feature of the language. Those particular forms that exhibit the least amount of change occur most often and require the least amount of effort for you to memorize. Now, when it comes to the addition of pronominal suffixes to the imperfect verb, there's only one extra feature that we need to study before we move on to the imperative verb, and that is the imperfect with noon suffixes. The imperfect with noon suffixes. Look at your screens with me. In addition to type 1 and type 2 pronominal suffixes, there are three additional suffixes that occur with some frequency. These suffixes are called the noon suffixes because of their distinctive spelling with noon. Now, look at the screen below, and you'll see a chart and you'll see type 1 pronominal suffixes in the very left-hand column, type 1 and the alternate forms that you'll see in the 2MS, 3MS, and 3FS categories. Then you'll see to the right of the type 1 suffix category, the noon suffixes. The noon suffixes, they are echa, enu, and ena. Now in the 3MS and 3FS forms, you will see enu and ena, and you'll understand that they're called noon suffixes, because each of those forms have a noon in the spelling. However, in the 2MS category, echa, you'll observe that there's no noon in that spelling, but we call it a noon suffix. Why? Well, here's the reason. The noon of the noon suffix has assimilated as a doggish forte into the cough. So do you see the doggish forte in the cough of the 2MS noon suffix? That doggish forte represents a noon that is assimilated. It used to be encha, something like that. But you know, whenever it can, a noon loves to assimilate. It loves to assimilate into the following consonant as a doggish forte. And this particular environment allows for it. So you just have to trust me on this particular form, that this form is actually a noon suffix form. So not only do you have to learn the regular type 1 form, you also have to learn the alternate type 1 form, and then these three noon suffix forms. Now, these three noon suffix forms do appear with some regularity, so it is important that you memorize them. So really, today, the only big changes that you have to get are three forms in the imperfect, right? You have to realize that the stem vowel will reduce to vocal schwa in the imperfect, and then only three new forms, these noon suffixes, need to be memorized. After that, it's really pretty good going when it comes to pronominal suffixes. There's not a lot to memorize, but you want to memorize these things carefully. And so when there's not a lot, you could spend extra time being precise. You will also observe on your screen that the translation value of the noon suffix is identical to the regular type 1 or alternate type 1 suffix. There's no difference in translation value. There's simply a difference in form. In fact, you'll come to observe in your study of pronominal suffixes that these particular pronouns do exhibit a measure of diversity in their spelling. The reason for these changes is due to both dialectical differences, that is, different regions of Hebrew use different pronominal suffixes like they do even today. For example, 
In the north, there's the you and the all, and in the south, there's the y'all, right? They love to pronounce things slightly different. And then there are the older forms, the thou and the thine forms in English, and the newer forms, the you and the your forms. So you've got dialectical and diachronic features at work, both in Hebrew and English. And so you'll see some diversity of forms appearing. It's not to torture students. It's not to sanctify them, not to give them extra trouble. It's actually a feature of the language that we still have in English, that is a diversity of forms based upon the region we live in and the time span we live in. The same thing occurs in Hebrew. We have both regional differences and chronological differences, and those are preserved. And so you'll see different clusters of them throughout the Hebrew Bible. In earlier parts, one form, and later parts, another form. Um, in northern Israeli context, one form, and in southern Israeli context, another form. And you'll begin to appreciate that diversity as you progress through the language. And so it's just one of the things to point out. But only three forms, no difference in translation value. Next, let's move to our study of the imperative conjugation with pronominal suffixes. Look at your screen with me. When you add a pronominal suffix to the cal imperative, we'll need to talk about each of the different forms. And so first we'll talk about the 2MS form. The imperative 2MS form, katol, spelled with vocal schwa and holem stem vowel, is spelled kot something, that is with kama tatuf and silent schwa, followed by the pronominal suffix. In this particular instance, you've got the shifting of the O class stem vowel back to the first syllable. So instead of shamor, it's going to be shom something. All right? The O class stem vowel has shifted back, and you're going to take the pronominal suffix and its connecting vowel at the end. So let's look at our two examples. The regular cal imperative 2MS form, shamor, plus the pronominal suffix mem, or the 3MP pronominal suffix mem, takes the seri connecting vowel. And so the, the pronunciation of the entire form is shamraim, shamraim. You have the O class vowel in the first syllable, followed by the pronominal suffix with an E class connecting vowel. Now, by connecting vowel, I simply mean this. You can't simply add the pronominal suffix directly to a consonant. Hebrew doesn't like two consonants in a row at the end of a word. And so in order to smooth out the pronunciation, Hebrew is going to add a connecting vowel between the last consonant of the verbal root and then the pronominal suffix. That's called a connecting vowel because it connects them or it glues those consonants together. All right. So on the slide here, you'll see shom reim, shom reim. The E class vowel under the resh is simply the connecting vowel. Now, the connecting vowels in Hebrew are variable. And for that reason, we don't want you to memorize them. Sometimes E class, sometimes A class. Uh, there's no, there are rules for this, but there's no need to memorize them. They're kind of complicated and diverse, and there's lots of exceptions to them. Simply understand that when your form ends in a consonant and you take a pronominal suffix, you're going to get some type of connecting vowel, usually an A or an E class, shom reim. Look at our second example, shafot, shafot. That's the cal imperative 2MS form. We're going to add the 1CS pronominal suffix, ni. So the form is going to change from shafot to shoft. And then we're going to add the ani, the ani. So it's shoftani, shoftani. You can see at the beginning the comma tattoo from the first syllable. That's probably the trickiest feature to identify when it comes to identifying cal imperative verbs with a pronominal suffix. The characteristic vocal schwa holem pattern that is diagnostic of the cal imperative 2MS changes to comma tatuf in a closed syllable, followed by the pronominal suffix with a connecting vowel. Shomraim, you observe them. Shoftani, you judge me. Easy. Next. Number two, the imperative 2FS, kit li, and the 2MP, kit lu, both ending in a vowel, do not change their spelling before a pronominal suffix. So that's good news. The 2FS and the 2MP forms simply maintain their strong verb spellings, and, they take, and then you just simply add the pronominal suffix to it. The reason for this is the fact that each particular verb form already ends in a vowel. So you don't need an extra connecting vowel. So all the spelling is maintained. Tifshu, tifshum. From sees or you sees to tifshum sees them. Dear shu, dear shuni, seek me. So these particular forms are very easy to identify 
And later on, it, when we get to chapter 23, I'll even specify more clearly and give you kind of clues how to identify the imperative in context with relative ease. Before we move on to our next slide, you'll observe that I didn't discuss the spelling of the imperative to FP with a pronominal suffix for the simple reason. It doesn't occur, and so you don't need to worry about it. Because that particular form, ketona, ends in a comete, it actually can't take a pronominal suffix. The, the rules actually forbid it. So if it did have a particular object that it wanted to indicate, it would have to use the definite direct object marker with that particular form and not simply attach the pronominal suffix directly to the verb. So we don't have to worry about that particular form at all. So let's look at your screen and identify one more feature that's important to understand with the imperative. Number three, imperatives with a pathic stem vowel, that is those forms that will usually have a guttural in the second or third root position, will lengthen the pathic to comments before a pronominal suffix. All right? So now that's a little bit different than what we saw in the 2MS, the regular form, where you had the O class stem vowel. In the O class stem vowel, you had the change going on in the first syllable. You had the vocal schwa change to kamatsatuf. The change is slightly different, and this isn't as common, but it's important to understand and recognize. When you have a verb that has the A class stem vowel, which means you'll have a guttural in the second or third root position causing that stem vowel to appear there, the change will be less pronounced. You won't get a change in the first syllable. You'll maintain the vocal schwa. But what will happen is the short A in the stem vowel will go or change to the long A, pathic to comets. Now you've seen this type of change and you recognize that vowels like to change. It can be long, long A, comets, short A, pathic, or even the reduced A, hotev, pathic, all right? So you can see things change up and down the um, spectrum of vowels. When you add a pronominal suffix, to verbs of this type, imperatives with an A-class stem vowel, the pathic will lengthen to comments. So the change isn't as significant, and they're easy to identify. Finally, let's talk about parsing verbs with pronominal suffixes. When it comes to parsing verbs that take pronominal suffixes, you want to be sure both to identify the verb and also the pronominal suffix. Let's look at our screens together. When parsing verbs with pronominal suffixes, you must first parse the verb and then identify the pronominal suffix in the categories of person, gender, and number. So you'll see two examples at the bottom of the page. Nathaticha, which is the Cal Perfect 1CS from Nathan, noon, tau noon. And you'll see that it appears with a 2MS pronominal suffix. That's how you identify these particular verbs when you parse them. You give the regular parsing. You begin with stem, then conjugation, person, gender, and number of the verb, you give the verbal root, and then you finish with the person, gender, and number of the pronominal suffix. Look at the second example, yilkathenu. That's the cal imperfect 3ms from lakath, lamed, kaf, dalit, but this time with the 3ms suffix. Now, this might not look like your normal 3ms suffix, but it's the noon suffix. It may help you at the beginning to identify the noon suffixes in your parsing just to reinforce the fact that it's not the regular type 1 or even the alternate type 1. It's, in fact, the noon suffix, so the third category. All right, that's all there is in this particular session for pronominal suffixes on verbs. Let me review the big features with you that are important to emphasize before you progress to the next chapter. Number one, when it comes to pronominal suffixes on verbs, they, they maintain the objective translation value. They function as the definite direct object of the verb. Let me say that again. When a verb takes a pronominal suffix as the object suffix, that object is considered a definite direct object. That's why sometimes it can appear with the accusative particle, the definite direct object marker, or simply suffix right to the verb. When it comes to the perfect conjugation and the taking of pronominal suffixes, the changes are pretty distinctive and you need to study those changes. For example, in the 3MS, you go from the, you go from the, the comets pathic vowel pattern to the schwa comets vowel pattern. That change is substantial enough that you need to memorize it. Secondly, there are three forms that are, are, exhibit pronounced changes, and you'll need to memorize those particular forms. When it comes to the imperfect, there are no radical spelling changes to observe or memorize. You simply need to know one rule. In those particular forms that have the O class or the A class stem vowel, the stem vowel will reduce to vocal schwa before it takes the pronominal suffix. When it comes to the imperfect verb taking pronominal suffixes, you simply have to learn three additional suffixes, those noon suffixes. 
And yes, the 2ms noon suffix doesn't have a noon, but the noon is assimilated as a doggish forte, so don't be tricked. Trust me, it's always there. When it comes to the imperative, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing you have to worry about when it comes to the imperative is the 2ms. In the 2ms with the O class stem vowel, the stem vowel O goes back to the first syllable as kamatsatuf. In the imperative 2ms with the A class stem vowel, the stem vowel just simply lengthens from pathic to comets. That's all you have to really understand in this chapter to successfully identify both the verb and the pronominal suffix. There are two things now you want to be identifying, the verb and its form and the pronominal suffix and its form, because always a change in form is precipitated by sometimes when you add something to the end. You want to be sensitive to those changes so you accurately understand and identify each form as it's intended. Well, that's it for this chapter. I'll look forward to our lecture in chapter 20.